I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, we have some really important topics going on today. Yeah, you've heard about the White Oak and the White Oak Initiative before on this show, but we're really going to take a deep dive into yes, White Oak today. So we're really excited, glad to have you all with us. Um, we're going to start off today's presentations um, with Dr. Jeff Stringer. He'll be talking about the White Oak Supply, kind of that situation going on with that. We also have Dr. Matt Springer with us. He's going to be talking about kind of that relationship between White Oak and wildlife and just how very important it is. And then we've got a special video presentation of how a barrel is made. You know, a lot of people don't realize all the steps that go into the production of a barrel um, to make that beautiful bourbon that we make here in Kentucky. Yeah, there's a multitude of steps that you have to. And I think a lot of people that will see this video won't realize all of the detail it takes just to get to the bourbon barrel itself. Yeah, no doubt. So we're really excited to have you all with us. Um, you can interact with us via Zoom on the chat pod and um, we'll respond to you there. Exactly. So let's go ahead and get started. So Dr. Stringer, if you'd like to turn your camera on. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to be here. Welcome. 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 So tell us a little bit about what you're going to present on today. Well, I think um, a lot of people recognize that White Oak is an important part of our forest here in Kentucky and East Fly, really in the U.S. Um, historically, it's always been a valuable uh, timber producer and, you know, species we use for lots of different things. We'll talk some about that. Um, and, you know, it, and the, it's been in the news a lot from the standpoint of um, it's particularly important for here in Kentucky for our bourbon industry. And, um, you know, that's what we make barrels out of exclusively, uh, white oak. And so uh, the, the growth of that industry certainly has provided some spotlight on this species, you know, and its sustainability and availability. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about that. All right. Excellent. Well, looking forward to your presentation. All right, well, let's, well, let's go ahead and get started. So we'll give you a little background information first as we, as we go to talk about this, and then we'll get into the details of kind of where we're at uh, on its, uh, certainly its, its current availability and where, more importantly, where we're headed in long term. Now, you know, from a timber perspective, I mentioned that it's historically, you know, of high value. There's lots of different products uh, that you can get out of one white oak tree, and I've just listed a, a, some of them here. Uh, the bottom part of a, a typical white oak saw timber size tree, let's say 18, 20, 22 inches in diameter, by the way, that might be uh, 80 to 120 years old. You get a lot of um, uh, veneer comes from that for furniture manufacturing. Uh, stave logs, so staves are the vertical pieces in a barrel. Um, so that's where our, our barrel logs and, and barrels come from is the bottom portion of that tree as well as high quality lumber. As you move up in the tree, you, there's other products that are cut from that tree. Uh, railway ties, uh, things to make pallets out of, that kind of thing. And, and finally, pulpwood. Uh, some of uh, oak is used, white oak is used for uh, the small branches, chipping them up and using, making paper out of them. So there's a, a wide range of uses uh, for white oak from a timber perspective. And of course, value in that, you know, from, from a timber standpoint. Now it's also, and we'll be talking about this later in the show, uh, but white oak is highly valuable for wildlife both from food from an acorn or hard mass standpoint, as well as habitat. And we'll talk about more, and uh, Dr. Matt Springer will talk about that later in the program. And I should mention this too, that with all the interest these days in global warming and, and carbon credits for landowners and carbon sequestration, white oak is a great species to talk about that when you talk about uh, all, those, all those different um, interests and concerns, because it is a long life species, stays in the woods a long time. It can live up to two, three, 400 years old and sequester carbon. And a lot of those products we make are long life wood products. So you sequester that carbon for a long period of time. So white oak could be a great player uh, in, in, in thinking about carbon sequestration as well. So the species is a winner for a lot of different reasons. There's a lot of different interests in it. So what I'm showing you now is just the range map of where white oak occurs. And so you can see it occurs all the way from, you know, down the uh, deep southeast uh, U.S. up through the lake states. However, the majority of the volume of, of white oak comes from the central part of that range, which Kentucky is right in that area. Ozarks, Missouri, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, and that central Appalachian area. So that's where a lot of the white, the white oak comes from. Now, let's talk a little bit more in depth about white oak supply. 
Um, so what you're seeing here, of course, across the bottom of this is different age classes, the 10 year age classes. And you see that the highest bars there peak at like that 70 to 80 year uh, age classes in there. And, and the height of these bars represent how many millions of acres there are of white oak forests. So these are forests that have, you know, some type of white oak overstory in them, larger trees in them, you know, maybe uh, 20 or 30 percent at least of the overstory being, being in white oak. So we have a lot of acres of white oak forest. And that's why they're important for wildlife. That's why they're important for us to think about from a conservation standpoint and represents a sizable amount of a volume of timber that's out there for the industry. Now, you'll also notice though, that if you're looking back to the left, there aren't a lot of acres coming on to ultimately replace this that are 10 years old or 20 years old or 30 years old, okay? So over time, what happens is this, this, this peak that you see that's in that 60, 80 year range, it goes to the right. So 10 years from now, this whole thing will shift to the right. 20 years, it'll shift further, that kind of thing. And so what we're concerned about is there's not as many acres coming that are younger to be able to take its place ultimately. Now, there's, a, there's no needed need for, need for panic because look at, we're talking a lot of acres, millions of acres out there. They're in white oak forests that are continue to age. And because white oak, luckily, hangs around for a long time, it's not like all of a sudden those forests are going to die off. They won't. However, you know, when you think about it uh, from the standpoint of taking 80 to 100 years to grow a white oak tree that's, that's a, that provides good habitat, you know, for roosting places for bats, right, or wildlife, lots of acorns for wildlife, or lots of volume for timber, you know, you have to be thinking about the replacement of those 80 and 120 year old forests now. You can't wait to get 10 years out and then think about it, okay? So this gives you a little bit of information about the age of our white oak forests, which are aging, right? And what we're concerned about sustainability is long-term, not 10 or 20 years from now, but, but, but 80 and 100 years from now. But in forestry terms, you have to think about that now. And one of the reasons we're concerned about that and we're not seeing good replacement here of some of our forests is because of a lack of the, reach, the natural regeneration of the species. So you have an oak forest that's in place now, and is it regenerating itself or not? Well, this was data, what you're seeing here in this map was data that was produced uh, by Dr. Lance Biggers and, and, and uh, uh, for, he, was, he did this when he was at the University of Missouri. He's now at the University of Kentucky. He's one of our four or three professors here. And what this analysis shows is that, that how well white oak stands. So, so we've got, a, we've got a, a forest, if you will. When I say stand, a forest that has a lot of white oak in the overstory now, a lot of larger white oak trees in it. Is it regenerating or not? What this map shows is the presence or absence of oak seedlings because for oak to naturally generate, it has to develop seedlings underneath uh, an overstory of oak, right? That can advance and grow. We'll talk more about that. But the lighter the color here that you see, okay? The less oak regeneration there is under in existing oak forests. So some areas are pretty dark, like the Ozarks, for example. So the Ozarks, it's a little drier out there and you see a lot more oak regeneration occurring in those forests, okay? As you move east and look at the difference in Kentucky, Western Kentucky, we have some areas that are doing pretty good and some areas where that dark green or dark blue is starting to fade into lighter colors. And so what happens is there's lots of areas where the, throughout the range of white oak where the 50% or less of those white oak stands have adequate regeneration in them. So this regeneration issue is one of the things that's causing us to worry about um, the long-term sustainability of white oak, okay? So let's talk about why that's occurring. Okay, if there's white oak forests there now, why aren't they regenerating? That's a really good question, okay? And, and so we're seeing this, um, it, it's less of a problem out in the western part of the region, out in the Ozarks, where it's a little drier and site quality is not as good. And white oak likes that as less competition, right? But where we're really seeing our problems is are what we call medium high quality sites, ones that can produce you know, a lot of timber growth, 
you know, a lot of biomass growth, if you will, and those happen to be uh, in the eastern part of the range. Okay, so to regenerate the oak forest, as I mentioned earlier, there must be seedlings present. So you have an overstory of oak, drops acorns on the ground, and this little picture here, of course, is a naturally developing white oak seedling in those stands. Okay, and those seedlings must not only start. And those acorns must not only germinate and start to grow small seedlings, but those small seedlings must be able to get bigger, okay, over time. So they can ultimately replace the, the larger oak trees as they die or are used or harvested or whatever, okay? And so the oak forests that we have now were a result of or established in, in the 1800s, late 1800s and 1900s, okay? And the conditions that created our current oak forest really aren't, aren't there anymore. And we'll explain that. And that's what's causing some of this disconnect between there being a lot of oak forests now without many regenerating adequately at this point. It's because of the conditions that were present when our forest started back in the 1800s, 1900s, you know, compared to what's going on now. So what I've got is a timeline up here. And then I just ran it back to 1700, if you will, this is a conceptual timeline. And, and back then, you see all the pictures there. Those were pictures that were taken, you know, obviously in black and white because they were taken at the, the, you know, in the 1800s, turn of the century, that kind of thing. We do have one colored picture there that shows that forest fire on the far, on the far right-hand side bottom there, which is fairly recent, okay? But the conditions that were going on back in the 1800s, early 1900s, um, where we had, uh, the tanneries that were they were using oak to strip bark from to tan leather. Um, they were uh, I, there was a picture of an iron furnace there, so uh, a lot of our oak, a lot of our upland forests were being used for fuel for iron furnaces, and so fire was a constant on the landscape back then. Um, you know, our First Nation tribes used um, and you know peoples used fire as a tool, so there was a lot of burning that went on back then. And what happened is it created more open canopies and the thin bark species that were competitors for oaks and oak seedlings, they were kind of pushed off the landscape. So think as thin bark species, think in terms of maples and beech, okay? And so a lot of those species were, were pushed out of our upland forest because of the way we used land back then. Pretty abusive. Well, oak likes that, okay? So what happened over time though, uh, Smokey the Bear happens, uh, we start suppressing forest fires. They're not burning everywhere, you know, and that's going to continue. We're never going to start large-scale burning again of the forest like we had then. And what happened over time is we all of a sudden now those beech and maple, those thin bark competitors, they move back into these forests. So the conditions that 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 are present now and what we're doing with the land now is far different than it was in the 17, late 1700s, 1800s, and 1900s when our oak forest established. And that's why we've got so many oak forests now and why we're having trouble retaining them, okay? All right, so let's talk about current use for just a little bit because while we said, yeah, we're not, we're not grazing hogs in the forest anymore, we're not burning randomly, you know, those kind of things, um, what are we doing? Well, we're building subdivisions in them for starters. Right? We do those kind of things. So you got urban sprawl that happens, okay? Um, but you also have use for, for timber harvesting, and that's the pictures that I have up there now. And so what I wanted to show you was, was a, another little map here, and you can see the different colors, um, you know, red, yellow, and green, if you will. Um, and what, these, what this is, is represents, uh, red represents areas that were removing more white oak than were growing. Okay, you notice this is, this is the range map again of white oak. So the little red areas show us places where we are removing, which means it could be timber harvesting or it could be, uh, you know, expansion, you know, um, urban sprawl and those kind of things. But we're taking land out of, we're removing more white oak than we're growing. The areas that are uh, in, in a color uh, like that yellow or green are areas where we're growing that we're removing. So what happens here is we've got a matrix, if you will, of current land use, I mean, current use of our forest where we're losing some white oak in place and we're gaining, okay? All right, and I will mention this. There is more demand for what we call higher quality white oak trees, those that can be used for uh, higher valued products that need like uh, wood with no branches in them, 
um, you know, in, or no knots in them. All right, that's would be like for veneer. Uh, to make a barrel, you can't have knots in it. So you have to have nice clean wood or higher value logs and trees out there. And for high quality lumber, it's the same thing. So there's a lot more pressure on our higher quality. And a lot of those areas that are in red right there are, are showing reductions in our white oak because of the demand for the higher quality products, okay? All right, so we kind of know all this, all right? All this biology that's going on, the use that's going on. So what's our response to that? Well, um, we developed what's called the White Oak Initiative. We're gonna talk a little bit about that and give you some information on it. And this initiative started, this region-wide uh, interest in White Oak uh, uh, causes a uh, White Oak Initiative start. And it was really driven from the awareness of, of, of White Oak dependent industries on what's going on with their White Oak supply, okay? And so let me give you a little history of how this, all this awareness and the formation of the White Oak Initiative from this awareness occurred, okay? And so um, a little bit on how the initiative started. Well, to try to get information, we did this as part of you know, University of Kentucky Forestry Extension, where I ran uh, two sustainability conferences, one in 2015 and one in 2017. Uh, and we ran these one day conferences on white oak sustainability. And we had present over a hundred in both sessions of forest industry, those that were dependent, either solely dependent, like cooperages and state mills and stuff that went into uh, bourbon produ uh, bur barrel production uh, for our, largely for our bourbon industry. Um, and other white oak industries, you know, that used uh, other industries that use white oak, like flooring, for example, uh, cabinetry, those kind of things. We had distillers were present, uh, agencies like Kentucky Division of Forestry was there, U.S. Forest Service, those kind, and conservation groups like uh, Nature Conservancy and others that are concerned about, uh, and wildlife groups um, that were concerned about about our white oak uh, availability and sustainability. So we ran these two conferences. And, and when everybody that was there saw what was going on with White Oak, we presented a lot of data and that kind of thing, okay, there was interest in developing some type of partnership or something that we could do as a group uh, to, to we could start to deal with the sustainability issue. So um, everybody that was present, uh, particularly in that 2017 meeting said, yeah, we need to do something, we need to form a partnership. And it was from that that we, uh, we developed this idea or concept for a White Oak initiative. And this was this concept was developed by us here at the University of Kentucky Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, and myself was a big part of that. Um, and and then the American Forest Foundation. Some of you may may know them uh, because this is who runs uh, the American Tree Farm System, for example. So American Forest Foundation, its president, myself, got together along with um, individuals at Brown Foreman. Uh, obviously interested in, in bourbon production and white oak availability. And we basically formed this white oak initiative, okay? So the white oak initiative is a collaboration to deal with white oak sustainability, okay? And, and the interest is, there's broad interest in this as you might expect, given what white oak is used for and that kind of thing, okay? And you can see there a number of initial partners that came together to form this initiative. There's a, a lot of logos there, of course. Some of these are distillers, Brown Foreman, you re may recognize Sazerac, Independent Stave Company, the top uh, right hand logo. That's the largest producers of barrel in the world, barrels in the world. And their, their company is, is, is headquartered and was founded in Missouri. It has plants here in Kentucky, that kind of thing. Beam Centauri, those kind of things. There's agencies there, you have Forest Service, um, you know, state agencies, um, forest industry, all that kind of thing. So you can see the wide range of interest there was in, in, in forming this initiative. So what I'm gonna do now is we've got about a, a two or two and a half minute video that we're gonna have Billy run here uh, that's just about the formation of this initiative. A lot of different people, for a lot of different reasons, care about our white oak forests. Numbers right now are showing that growing stock of younger oaks is declining. That causes a long-term sustainability concern. 
because it's a slowly evolving issue, it's hard to bring often attention to it because it's not something that just happens overnight. Because if it takes 50 or 80 or 100 years to grow this, you have to think about it now. We've got a lot of middle-aged to older age forests. What's missing is a lot of the younger. 40 to 50 years from now, we may have a tightening of supply. That would really hurt a lot of industry. There's a demand for higher quality white oak, for, for barrel production, for veneer, for lumber production, all those kind of things. The challenge is, is, is landowners being aware of good management practices, loggers being aware of good logging practices. That's what the White Oak Initiative is trying to address. Part of what the White Oak Initiative is doing is taking all of this wide variety of organizations coming together to say, how do we teach farmers, either private or public, to grow or maintain their forest? What we do is step in and give them a leg up. As a result of that, allow the white oak to compete, grow larger, faster, and regenerate the site. Once we have adequate reproduction on the ground, then we can start thinking about our harvest. To fix long-term forestry issues like we have here, it takes collaboration. We're often working with clients on a multi-generational basis. The oak regeneration that we've seen today, my grandchildren may end up harvesting that. When land is forest land is managed well, it produces benefits not only to the owner of that land, but it produces benefits far beyond those boundaries that benefit the public at large. This is where we get clean water from. This is where we get wildlife habitat. If we want to have all those things, 50, 100 years from now, you have to manage this resource. So by being foresightful and looking ahead, we now can enjoy the things that we so value from Oak Forest. Okay, so I think that, that video did a pretty good job of um, kind of uh, talking about what a White, White Oak Initiative is, okay? Um, what it has done since it's uh, since it was formed, and we've got roughly we've got a couple million dollars that have gone into this. And what I've, I've put up on the screen right now are just different um, different action items, different things that the White Oak Initiative is starting to produce. Uh, we developed a White Oak Assessment and Conservation Plan, which outlines uh, which outlines where we need to be thinking about doing White Oak management. Um, in, you know, here in the Eastern U.S. And, and what needs to be done to improve white oak sustainability. Uh, we developed management guidelines and landowner resources for, uh, for identifying oaks and managing oaks. Uh, we're in the process of COVID set us back on this, but developing regional workshops, trainings, and online trainings uh, for foresters, landowners, and loggers, all those that are involved in, in what happens and goes on in, in the forest. And uh, we're even dealing with things like policies a, you know, po federal policy that, in, that makes sure that we're encouraging white oak. For example, is there money in the farm bill for forestry practices and that kind of thing? Um, so the initiative is involved in a lot of those things. And finally, uh, supporting, not from a dollar standpoint, but providing, um, you know, uh, uh, support, written support for and encouragement uh, uh, for uh, research on, on white oak. And so there's a lot of action that, that's going on here. If you want to get more uh, information on this, go to uh, whiteoakinitiative.org, where you can find some of these publications I've talked about and the videos there and that kind of thing. Um, and so there are quite, that's the place to go if you want more information on this. And, and in particular, you know, we, I mentioned that the conservation plan that's available there online, you can download it. I mentioned uh, landowner publications and resources, and we've got a number of those as well. And so you can go to that website and, and, and get those. So this gives you a little, um, a little idea anyway uh, about, about White Oak, some of the issues behind White Oak and what we're doing and how we've responded to it through the White Oak condition. So I hope this made sense to everybody. I know it showed a lot of data and figures and graphs. Um, so hopefully I didn't overdo things there. <laughs> yeah, that was great. So um, if anyone has any questions, please type them in the chat pod, obviously. Um, and, and Dr. Stringer can get those answered. Um, but it sounds like it's a it's a great initiative to keep things going in the white oak arena, so to speak. <laughs>
<laughs> long term hopefully yes yeah um, uh, you know jeff you know having been around forestry for a few years I, I this white oak initiative is such an exciting time you know in our forestry world here in kentucky to see so many different partners come together um trying to address a common issue it's really a, a beautiful thing in many ways so uh, just some um, kudos to you and the whole woi team um, for all the work of pulling this together for sure Thank you. I appreciate that. It is a big effort. And like was said in the video, we all to get to, to manage these kind of things and deal with these kind of things on a landscape scale like we're talking about. Everybody's got to be involved. Professionals, landowners, uh, policymakers, you know, and that's what the White Oak Initiative was was developed to do. Yeah, there was, was a comment in the chat pod. Somebody had said they dropped off some acorns as part of the White Oak Tree Improvement Project. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Larka Wald's been heading that up and she's um, received acorns from all over the White Oak Range um, and worked really closely with the Kentucky Division of Forestry getting those um, planted. So appreciate that, Tracy. So, you know, I, I know we've talked about this before, Billy, but um, we've talked about with landowners, like they just can't afford just to not do anything with their property anymore. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And I think, you know, Jeff does a great job of illustrating some of those concerns, you know, just because we've got trees out there right now um, doesn't mean the future is secure for sure. Okay. Um, someone came in and said that they've had having difficulty finding a qualified forester that can assist with my new hardwood forest in central uh, Missouri. Are there any ideas? Well, I mean, so each state, and I don't know what I was oh, Mississippi, Missouri. sorry, Mississippi. It's Mississippi. Yeah, so, um, you know, all states have, uh, state, at least in the East, that have any force in them, right, have, have state agencies, you know, that, that provide that assistance here in Kentucky, it's the Kentucky Division of Forestry. You know, in Mississippi, I believe, it may be the Forestry Commission, or I don't know what their name is, but there's a state agency there that can do that. And I'd reach, I'd definitely reach out to them uh, first on this. All right. Well, it looks like we don't have any other questions. So, oh, here we had one just come in. Uh, popped in. Oh, they're starting to come in now. Okay. Um, we have a, a, oops, let's see, a performed timber harvest management um, and with NRCS practices. And now they're too old to do any work. What if any resources are available without requiring a big chunk of our limited financial resources? Billy, you want to handle that or? Uh, well, I think, you know, it, I'm not sure as far as um, uh, the whole nature of what's going on there, but I would say that there are some vendors out there that can do some of that work. So if it's a, a physical opportunity or ability to do that, um, there is some um, help out there. Um, again, you know, we do have quite a few programs that are out there through um, NRCS. The EQIP program is the one. Um, and that money is set aside for forest conservation practices. And I think we really need to use that money for forest conservation practices. Um, so if, if the concern there um, to the to the um, commenter was about using those, those are meant to be used. So please use those EQIP funds for good forest conservation. That's what they're for. And, and we need to do that. So I wouldn't worry about um, you know depleting those. We need to use all we can get of those. And there are contractors out there available to help with some of this in places. So your local forester ought to know about that. Or if not, you can get a hold of get a hold of us, and we might be able to help with that. Another question come in about planted white oaks, um, saplings, and is it common practice to use tree gardens to protect them from deer and other wildlife? Well, you need to protect them. Yes, you need to protect them from deer and other wildlife. Um, you know, particularly if they're planted because they're more susceptible to browse. You know, they probably got a bigger nutrient availability and load in them and those kind of things and they they kind of attract animals wildlife um so you can't do that especially if they're planted out in the open there's plenty of sunlight there and you can't put tree guards protectors on them and those kind of things um so that is something that you you do have to think about um is there any project similar to help with hickory species the answer is no good luck with that one so there, there's not and, and it's because the, the white oak has become popular and there's a lot of interest in it because of its broad use, particularly with, with, um, with industry. Um, and that's just not the case with hickory at this point in time, okay? Um, and, then, and so the, the, there's, you know, there's people that are interested in, in maintaining and making sure their growth white oak trees and forests are healthy, right? They need help with that. And again, the Kentucky, here in Kentucky, the Kentucky Division of Forestry is a state agency that provides that, that first level of assistance to landowners, you know, in regards to forest health. If you're a landowner and your objective is forest health, um, their, their foresters can come out and help you and advise you and develop a plan to help maintain, you know, a healthy forest, okay? 
And so a uh, question was about the active management. What active management strategies work best in producing advanced wide open generation? It all depends upon the site you're in, the condition. However, having said that, if you go to whiteoakinitiative.org and go to resources and look up land, there's landowner resources there. And, and there are three publications. I should have flashed one on the screen a minute ago, uh, but it was on the challenges of upland oak uh, management regeneration. So it described this regeneration process. But there's one of those publications that's specific to those practices that are used for white oak management. So go there, get those resources. If you have problems, contact us and we can, you know, help direct you uh, to those. Okay. And I think, well, yeah, there's a lot of questions coming in. So I don't know if yeah. you guys are scanning those or whatever you got. Yeah. yeah. I saw another kind of follow up on that assistance. Yeah. And Equip is based on a cost share basis. Um, and there are a couple categories. So if you're like a, a new farmer or underserved audience, you can get, I think, like 90 to 95% of the cost covered. Um, and if you're um, not in that category, then you can get like 75% of those costs covered. Oftentimes you can find um, vendors or others that may do it for those costs. Um, there are also some state cost share programs here in Kentucky, at least if you're in Kentucky, we do have a state cost share program that's run through the conservation um, service. And if you're in a county that had tobacco historically, there is some program for um, ag diversification, which covers forestry management practices at the county level as well. And your county conservation district should have information on that. And, um, and I'd be happy to speak to you more about this if you got more questions. Yeah, and also this real quick, uh, Tracy, obviously we don't want the tree falling down on your house, okay? So if it's a health issue involving, you know, a tree that's in a yard or, you know, that, that kind of thing that's not in a forest context, so to speak, uh, you need to go to a, a, your local arborist that can come out, right, and help you urban tree care, right? They can come out and help assess, you know, what's going on with those kind of trees and help you make sure that you're maintaining those you know, in a healthy fashion, so you don't have any issue, uh, but you need to go to an arborist there to be able to do that. Um, okay, so following the selected timber arch, there's a bare area on my land where loggers stage their truck loading. Is there any help for landowners reestablishing white oak saplings on this land? Well, yeah, there would be, uh, and so, but, but you wanna be careful about this for a lot of different reasons. Not every piece of ground out there is, is appropriate to plant, uh, you know, any given species, all including white oak, right? So areas that have been compacted a little bit, and, and so that landing or log deck area is what you're referring to, uh, those can be compacted, so that's got to be broken up and up. But this, again, the Kentucky Division of Forestry can help you with that. They can assess that and your interest in white oak and if what could be done there, and if that's appropriate area, you know, for to plant white oak trees back in and that kind of thing, they can help you with that. And then there was another comment about somebody had, had applied for some of the funding and hadn't been funded yet. And um, that's unfortunate. And I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, don't let that discourage you from applying again. You might want to evaluate a little bit if you can see um, maybe why you didn't get qualified, if you can get any feedback from that from them. And um, that may help you um, kind of shore up your application. Many of those projects are based on a ranking system. So they basically have questions where they assign point values, um, depending on, you know, it, do you have threatened and endangered species? Or are you part of this other system or whatever? So understanding some of those ranking questions might help you um, better position your project to get funded. And I'd be happy to talk to you more about that too. Now, Billy, you put that link up there for, for certified arborist. Yep. Yeah. Somebody's looking for a certified arborist, check that out. All right. Got another one. Oh, another one came in. Come in. Um, I have been told by arborists and mill owners that if they can't be assured of at least a semi load, they are not interested. Mm -hmm. I have seen uh, single beautiful trees go to waste up for this region. Any way to get those into the pipeline when they need to come down? Uh, frequent yeah. question. <laughs> yeah, that 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 question comes up quite a bit because nobody wants to see you know something go to waste, right? Mm -hmm. um, that is that is a good. So it boils down to a little bit of economics, right? Um, if you've got average quality timber and stuff like that, it take it costs money to get equipment in there and get it out and all that kind of thing. So what you've heard is correct in some sense, in some cases. If you've got particularly highly valued uh, white oak or black walnut or whatever it might be, that, that could be a veneer tree, you could afford a logger or somebody could come in and, afford and pull one of those out, you know, per acre or one of those in your entire woods. 
However, trees, particularly if, if they're around, if they're in normal situations or they're on fence rows or they're in yards and stuff, generally those trees aren't, aren't wanted or accepted uh, for, for those kind of uses like veneering because the, the chance of having embedded metal in them and those kind of things is too high. It's a frustrating deal. Sometimes you can get, um, there are individuals around that portable mills and those kind of things that be willing to come in and, you know, and, and saw the lumber up and that kind of thing for you. And, and but, but it is a little bit of an unsatisfying situation. As Billy said, we get this, we get this kind of request a lot. Yeah. You know, it's, it's sometimes hard to deal with. It is, it's unfortunate. Um, well, it looks like that's all the questions we have. Thank you, Dr. Stringer for joining us. We yeah. you being on the show. Great Thank presentation. You. Great presentation. Thank Good you. Job. All right. Well, let's keep let's keep the wide oak train okay. going. Yes, exactly. And you know, we have a video on how a barrel is made, and I think you really will be interested in this. I know until you know we were doing this video, I didn't really understand all the steps it takes. Um, so it's a very detailed and long process. So let's go ahead and watch that. Yeah. Well, let's give a big shout out to um, Renee and Chad for putting the video together first. But, uh, <laughs> all right. Here we go. Let's check it out. We are currently overlooking an even aged harvest of a hardwood forest in northeastern Kentucky. High quality timber, including white oak trees for barrel staves and cooperage, grow best when many young seedlings grow under intense competition. Here, a feller buncher, a piece of mechanized logging equipment, is seen carefully operating around trees that are retained in buffers according to the Kentucky Forest Conservation Act best management practices and good logging practices. While safely in the reinforced self-leveling cab of the feller buncher, the operator can cut the trees with the articulating head saw and gather them to be pulled out of the woods by a skitter. While this takes a lot of the chainsaw work out of the equation, some trees may still need to be felled manually. It's interesting to sit back and watch this piece of equipment work with ease. Here we can see the grapple skidder operator back up to the logs to be able to quickly connect and skid the logs to the landing where they will be cut and merchandised for markets that fit their best use and highest available value. The skidder operator takes special care to not damage residual standing trees and travels along the skid trail to reduce compaction to the woodland. Here we can see the forester and logger both working on behalf of the landowner discuss board foot scale of logs as well as determining where to buck or cut the logs for the best markets and value. The logger is using a log scale stick to measure the length of the log and diameter on the small end to estimate how many board feet are within the log. Here we can see the truck being loaded using a grapple. The operator can use the grapple arm to pick up the logs and delicately place them between the bunks of the log truck trailer. For cooperage, white oak stave logs are received at a stave mill for the manufacture of staves. Staves are the individual pieces that make up a wood barrel. The loader operator unloads the truck on the yard, adding the logs to the inventory. As the logs move into production to become staves, they will be cut into smaller lengths slightly longer than the height of a finished barrel, a rough dimension of 37 to 39 inches, with a finished barrel height of approximately 3 foot. Lasers and sensors help the saw cab operator to make the best decisions. These short logs, referred to as bolts, are then quartered into four pieces. First, sawn in half, and then those halves will be sawn in half again, similar to slicing a pie. This is called quarter sawing. Quarter sawing is a unique way to cut wood. It ensures that the orientation of the cells in the wood are correct so that liquid does not easily leak through the staves. As the quarter sawn pieces rotate around the table, they are re-sawn, making quarter sawn boards, which will be trimmed and edged to become barrel staves. The production of staves takes a blend of knowledgeable people and different equipment and technology, as you can see in this very intricate process.
wood is naturally wet. In many cases, 50% of its weight is water. Staves must be dried very carefully so that they are ready for barrel construction and to change the compounds in the wood that are relied upon to give the bourbon its unique flavor. To start the drying process, the staves are moved outside to an air drying yard after they have been stacked in a way to allow air to circulate around each stave. The drying process helps some of the natural chemicals found in the wood to slowly change in a way that affects the taste of the bourbon, referred to as the flavor profile. Wood contains compounds like cellulose that make up the cell walls of the wood and other compounds that the tree produces including sugars. Technically, air drying reduces the amount of tannins a compound naturally produced by oaks that causes bourbon to have a strong taste. Hemicellulose, a part of the wood cell walls, is caramelized, which helps the absorption of sugars into the bourbon. The sugars in the wood are transferred to the spirit and together with the other compounds provide 70% of the flavor and all of the color in bourbon, making it a unique wood product. The length of time the staves set on the air drying yard is a minimum of 6 months to 24 and is determined by the flavor profile required by the distiller. The final drying of the staves is completed in a dry kiln to achieve a final moisture content of 12 to 14 percent on average. Once the staves are dried, they are then cut to a final length and processed to create a smooth surface. A barrel is wider in the middle than it is on each end and is cylindrical in shape. To achieve the cylindrical shape, the top surface of the staves are convex while the bottom surface are concave. These shapes are milled into the staves. The edges of the staves are machined at an angle, a process called jointing, to prevent leaks once they are formed into the cylindrical barrel shape. They are also machined wider in the middle than at each end, creating a trapezoid shape due to the barrel being larger in the middle than it is on each end. After the staves have been properly jointed, they are brought into the cooperage for assembly. 32 to 34 staves are assembled together vertically inside of a hoop placed near the floor. This process is called raising the barrel. The top of the barrel is then slightly squeezed and a temporary ring will be placed around the top of the barrel to hold the staves together. The raised barrel is then steamed so the staves can be bent into the final shape without breaking them. After steaming, the barrel is sent to a press to be bent to the final shape while having permanent bands inserted around the outside to hold it together. Once the barrel is in its final shape, its inside is charred using an open flame, as determined by the specifications from the distiller. Charring specifically is done by setting the inside of the barrel on fire for a short period of time, which opens the pores of the wood. Just like with drying, the charring acts to change compounds in the wood that produce a specific taste in the bourbon. The charring also creates a layer, like charcoal, that acts as a filter as the bourbon moves in and out of the wood on the inside surface of the barrel. The filtering changes or eliminates unwanted compounds that are produced during aging and contributes to its flavor. Various levels of charring can change the flavor profile of the bourbon and provides all of the color. Caramels, vanillin, and honeys are the common flavors enhanced from charring. Sometimes distillers request that the barrels are toasted before charring. Toasting a barrel is similar to the difference between toasting your bread and burning it up. Toasting adds a bit more vanilla and spicy flavors to the bourbon. The barrel heads are toasted as well. After toasting and charring, the barrel heads will then be inserted. Here the rings are tightened to ensure that they stay snug throughout the life use of the barrel. With the top and the bottoms installed, a small hole will be drilled for a bunghole. A small amount of water is sprayed into the barrel. The barrel is then pressurized, and the water sprayed into the barrel will make any leaks apparent. If there is a leak, experienced coopers will make necessary repairs. Using a combination of hand tools, wedges, and old world techniques, these masters of their craft help reduce the angel share lost in aging. Once the barrel passes inspection, it may receive some finish work, including branding or laser engraving with the manufacturer's logo or other important information. Finally, they are loaded into a trailer to be transported to the distillery customer, where they will be put into use, filled with bourbon, and placed in a rickhouse for aging. 
The minimum age for straight bourbon whiskey is two years, but many brands age well beyond this based on consumer preferences. The barrel can only be used once for bourbon per U.S. federal law, but due to the many downstream uses for used barrels, they can be reused many times in other ways. It is not uncommon for the barrel to outlive the person who made it throughout its many uses. Great video. <laughs> the process. It was a very long process to make a barrel. It's not just, hey, they're going to, you know, stack some wood together and they're done. <laughs> yeah, hopefully everybody has a greater appreciation for all of that, Renee. I mean, a lot of a lot of hands touch that wood before it kind of gets into that final barrel for sure. Exactly, exactly. So, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the wood itself. So now let's talk about wildlife. So we have Dr. Matt Springer. He is on and he's going to um, talk to us about the wildlife that uh, depend on uh, white oak as well. Hi, hey. Matt. How are you? I'm good. How are you all? Greetings. So, so, yeah, I'm going to give a little bit of a rundown of um, how you know the white oak plays a role uh, within our ecosystems and, and primarily how it impacts uh, some of those critters uh, that are found within those systems. Um, specifically, you know, I'm going to focus a little bit more on Kentucky, uh, but uh, many of these things hold true across the white oak range. All right. Uh oh. Over to it. Let me get this going here. All right. Um, so uh, we have um, basically, you know, this idea of the the, the forests within, you know, Appalachia and, and you know, specifically Kentucky, um, you know, sometimes we have this kind of picture in our mind of what that forest should look like. And um, the, you know, reality being that there's a lot going on within those forests and, and you know, the idea of, of a single tree, whether that be a white oak tree or, or whatnot, they play a variety of roles uh, within those systems, whether that's in a forest itself or you know, in an urban setting or, or some gradient uh, there within. Um, so if you look at what is going on with from a tree within in the system, well, it can be many things. Usually there's some kind of air benefit, right? Whether that, you know, sucking up uh, carbon uh, for, for CO2 benefits in terms of carbon storage, um, you, know, re, you know, providing more oxygen, uh, holding on to soil, which is a really vital component that, that has downstream health benefits for a lot of our aquatic critters. Um, as, as well as, you know, soil health um, in general. Um, you have uh, things like shading, uh, which is often overlooked as a benefit, uh, but helps keep textures down, especially if that tree is, is found over top of a water body like a stream. Um, the, you know, many species like, uh, especially our fish species like trout, are really dependent on those, those temperatures uh, being maintained at certain levels, especially in the summer, uh, to, for, for them to survive. Uh, as well as, you know, you have um, the things that uh, are uh, living on top of the, the, the tree, um, whether that be insects or wildlife, which is what I'm going to kind of to go into now. But um, we often overlook everything that is provided in terms of the benefits of the tree. We, we hear a lot about economic benefits. Uh, we just, you know, got a rundown of those. But um, there, there's a reason why we should care about trees in general. Um, not just the economics, but also the ecosystem functions and, you know, what comes from those in terms of property. Um, so if we look at white oak and what white oak provides wildlife, so how, how do wildlife see white oak? Um, and reality being, it's, it's kind of two things. Um, the first being, and, and the one that we often think of uh, more directly, is food. Uh, and whether that is, uh, as mentioned, in terms of protecting trees from browsing, deer, right? So, so the tree itself gets fed upon, uh, whether that be leaves or buds, um, or if it's a beaver, it goes right down the tree um, itself. Um, so it, it can take many forms, uh, as well as the one that we often think of as the mass that's produced. So all those acorns have incredibly high nutritional value for wildlife, and they're consumed by a lot of different wildlife species. Uh, but the one that we often overlook, um, on, I saw that Dr. Palmy was mentioned, uh, and as a University of Delaware alum, I got to hear all about um, how insects play vital roles within our system. Uh, and the great thing about oak is um, the they are the um, genus that supports the most Lepidoptera, so our moss and caterpillar species. Uh, so they are incredibly vital in terms of insect um, production, um, specifically those that are fed upon by a lot of different um, migrating and um, wildlife species. 
Then the other benefit that we often overlook uh, is that whole component of structure, which is a little bit more replaceable in some ways uh, for wildlife, but the fact that a tree is sitting in the woods is providing a structural component to that setting, what we often refer to as vertical cover. Uh, so there's the, the cover that exists in the canopy where you have many uh, migrating birds that are, are present, uh, as well as insects. Uh, and then you go down to all the way to the bottom where you have the trunk that exists that's providing cover for or in places to hide for things like uh, squirrels or raccoons uh, and so on. Um, so there's there's a structural benefit that is providing both cover from predators and as well as potentially nesting sites, denning sites um, for for many species, right? So birds are building nests in the, the limbs of the tree. We also have woodpeckers that are creating cavities in these trees. Uh, and, you know, those cavities, once they're created, you have what are called primary cavity users and secondary cavity users. So the primary ones that are created, the secondary are the ones that take over after the primary is abandoned. So you have multiple benefits uh, for from these trees within these systems for, for many, many wildlife species. Uh, I would, you know, even in Kentucky alone, it's probably easy to see a, um, that more than probably half of our wildlife or our true wildlife species, terrestrial wildlife species, are probably getting some benefit from white oak at some level uh, within their natural history cycle. So we can probably break that into those that are heavily reliant on white oak and those that are you know, somewhat, um, somewhat reliant on white oak and give you an idea of what that may look like. Um, you know, we have, as I mentioned, all of those species that probably exist within Appalachia and, and you know, the Ozarks and so on uh, throughout the range, you, you get these uh, species um, like our migrate, migrating birds, uh, that, you know, all those caterpillars and insects like the polyphemus moth that's present there in the picture, all those larvae that are walking around those oak trees, specifically white oak, which is, uh, you know, has uh, just as many as uh, most of the others, um, without that food that's there, uh, most of those populations would not be able to feed their young and therefore drastically decline or crash. Um, that holds true for, you know, I mentioned birds, but also many of our bat species. Uh, rely heavily on uh, many of those insects that are on those oaks uh, as well. Not to mention, if we start talking about mammals, um, you know, there are several here that um, can make do uh, without oaks, uh, in particular white oaks, because white oaks are that special, you know, in, in many ways in terms of the consistent production of mass, whereas red oaks kind of, um, you know, it takes two years for them to develop their egg corn, so it, it has a little bit um, maybe a little more sensitive to issues, uh, whereas white oaks, they, they tend to, to, to produce a little bit more on a regular basis. Um, so you have species like, you know, your squirrels, your mice that are, are really relying on that, um, that mass production to survive. They cache it through the winter. Uh, so you're, you're talking about these species would be in, in, in pretty hard shape in some ways um, if those uh, white oaks were not at high prevalence as they are now in the landscape. Now, if we look at indirect reliance, um, so I, the way I look at these are there are species that live, um, you know, have more broader ranges, but uh, within uh, the white oak range do, do um, greatly benefit from the presence of it. Uh, but, you know, they, they do exist in other places that don't have white oak. Uh, so, you know, things like um, the, the turkey, um, you know, many, many other birds um, that, you know, will take advantage of um, insects that are on uh, white oaks, but don't necessarily need them uh, for their entire cycle. So, you know, bluebirds would be one that they can uh, find enough uh, of larvae um, on other trees to, to feed their young, but uh, will take advantage of white oak. Um, deer, bears, uh, many of our larger mammals, uh, uh, raccoons, um, all these are, are, if there are white oak acorns on the ground, are going to be all over them. However, they have means of, of surviving without them. Um, but it is still, within the white oak range, a, a resource that is, a, without it present, would put these populations uh, at different levels in terms of probably reduce them greatly uh, because that resource is such a nutritional value, uh, it's hard to replace. And if we think about what, what would it look like potentially if we lost the white oak for wildlife, um, the, what, the way I kind of uh, viewed this was, you know, we, we lost a major mass producer at Appalachia already, um, one that was consistent and super abundant and super abundant uh, within the, the forest itself. Uh, so when, it, when we lost it, it was a major hit, right? So um, what I'm talking about is the American chestnut, 
Um, so, you know, if we think about that loss of the chestnut, what probably happened within our wildlife species, particularly our larger wildlife species, um, the chestnut's um, sheer abundance of mass that was produced and the, and the nutritional value. Um, you know, there's a lot of historical records uh, that talk about Daniel Boone, you know, coming into Kentucky and and the, the plethora of, of bear and, and uh, elk and, and deer. Um, most of those species, and the reason they were so abundant was because of the chestnut abundance that was able to support them. The consistent and large scale production of mass. Uh, and with that loss, we, we see um, we see that present with, especially within our white-tailed deer populations, uh, where you know their populations do well in good mass years, so we see, tend to see a bump uh, the year after a good mass year. Whereas um, in bad mass years, uh, we see a decrease. Uh, and when chestnut was present, um, you know that wasn't as big of an issue. Uh, so if we start thinking about where white oak is a major component of those forests, and if we lose that, then we get into this scenario of it's probably going to reduce those wildlife numbers within those those areas. Uh, because it's going to be harder for them to find high quality food throughout the winter. Um, you know, and, and what, what that does in terms of structural impacts in the forest, there's going to be another tree that replaces it, just like there are trees in the forest that replace the chestnut. Uh, so structurally, it's not a huge deal, but that loss of, of mass is going to be very impactful, uh, as well as the insect. Um, the insect, uh, you know, um, production is, is, you know, not when you lose one oak species, it's not as big of a deal as say you lose all oak species, the entire genus within the forest. Uh, but it's still one that you're losing diversity, uh, and therefore you're still going to lose some production and at least some uh, resilience to to um, disturbance and, and climate change. Um, for example, though, if you think about white oaks um, and, and potential impacts, so just you know, wild turkeys, uh, you saw the National Wild Turkey Federation was a major player within the white oak initiative. There's a reason. Uh, turkeys rely heavily on white oak acorn uh, to help them get fat, uh, fattened up before winter and get them through the winter, um, whereas I've uh, seen reports as much as, you know, potentially 50% of their diet on a daily basis uh, is, is acorn. Uh, so, you know, that, that can play a big role in, in one of our more iconic um, North American species, um, but it's, it's not the only one. And, and you know, the, the big thing here is trying to work towards ensuring sustainability. We're at that point, as Jeff mentioned, that we're, we're, not, we're not losing white oak immediately, um, but it's, it's something we have to start thinking about managing actively for and, and to ensure that this resource is present um, for future generations. So with that, I'll be happy to kind of take um, questions on, on wildlife and, and white oak, um, although it's just kind of skimming the surface. Well, Matt, I think you made a compelling case for why uh, white oak is important to um, wildlife, for sure. You know, we knew it was important to the distillery industry, but now we fully recognize its importance to wildlife. So thank you. Appreciate that very much. Let's see. Somebody said we have a lot of chestnut oaks. Is chestnut oak the, not the same as the American chestnut? And they are correct. That is a different species. Um, that is a, an oak compared to the American chestnut. It is an important wildlife species as well, but um, maybe not as important as the American chestnut was as far as widespreadness. Easy day today. Hey, that, that apparently, I think we've overwhelmed them with a lot of great content, Matt. Um, thank you so much. Um, let's see. Uh, anyway, to select the moray gulag crops, more regular. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, to select for more regular crops. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what you're looking for there, Shad. Sorry. Um, Shad, do you mean more regular mass production? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, um, you know, as, as Billy might be a better one to explain this as the forester, um, you know, the mass production is, is heavily influenced by, you know, climate as those acorns are being developed and nutrients that are available. So it's, it's one that, um, you know, and maybe Laura DeWald could speak to this of like trying to find the, the trees that are going to, uh, be able to deal with those um, issues a little better as they produce those acorns uh, in the future. Um, that would that would be my you know thought. Um, but there are folks on this 
call that know a lot more than I do. Yeah, certainly. I don't want to kind of overset my bounds, but I would say that, you know, we do know that white oak can be irregular and it's, um, you know, mass production. Um, we do expect every few years typically to get a pretty good crop um, and some trees are better producers than others. We do know that as well. So it is tough um, to do that. But that also is part of kind of that inherent challenge with managing for white oak, you know, knowing when those seedlings are there and available and something we've got to work with. So that's why it's so important to get ahead of a timber harvest um, to make sure that we have that in advanced regeneration in place um, so that it can take over that site. So um, good questions, but I'm not sure that there's a silver bullet for that one. All righty. Well, Matt, thank you. As always, appreciate your contributions to the show. Um, certainly appreciate Dr. Stringer for that great presentation on White Oak Supply, um, the outstanding video that Chad and um, Renee put together. Thanks. Renee had to run, but she sends her best. I do want to let everyone know, um, if you are a SAF um, forester, certified forester, you can get one hour of continuing education credit for that. If you need any um, information for that, you can kind of reach us at forestry.exchange extension at uky.edu, and we can try to help you out with that. Um, but without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and um, wrap this thing up and thank you each and every one for being with us. Please let others know about this show. We're here every Wednesday and we'll be back next Wednesday um, and we talk about a wide variety of forestry um, and wildlife related topics. Um, and you're good. it's a good opportunity to get some answers um, to questions that you may have had because um, we typically have some experts on here. So a big thanks to all of our presenters. A big thanks to Renee for putting together another great show and we'll look forward to seeing you all again next week on From the Woods Today. Bye-bye, everyone. From the Woods Today